Okay, let's get going. Um, welcome everybody. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, um, many countries on which we're meeting today and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Greater Kulin Nation um, and we're using our Melbourne Uni Zoom account as a host. They are also um, located on the lands of the Greater Kulin Nation and we recognize that their sovereignty is never ceded. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to First Nations people who are joining us here today. So welcome. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Um, evening events, sometimes you just want to stay snuggled up in front of the television. So we're pleased that you're here snuggled up in front of your um, computer screen with us instead. Um, it's really great. Uh, we are enjoying having some salons back in person, or we have been until we all went back into lockdown. Uh, but it's really great to uh, run these events across the country, uh, uh, online, so that we can um, come together across the country. And I know that um, people have made all sorts of fabulous connections in the Zoom rooms after our salons uh, with people they may otherwise have never had the chance to um, catch up with or even meet. So uh, we're very pleased that you're all here. So the salons, as many of you will know, are a very um, informal uh, format. It's really just about having an interesting conversation. We invite two people to uh, interview each other. As you probably know, there's no chair. Um, and I always say it's just kind of like being um, in the pub, only you've got an audience of uh, you know, 80, hundred people. Uh, so no pressure. <laughs> um, but of course, we, at our in-person salons, we always say there's only one rule, um, and that is that you have to meet someone that you don't already know. Um, we try and uh, um, keep carry that through in, in these events, and we have, at the end of the conversation, we will pop everybody into Zoom rooms, Zoom breakout rooms, uh, for a kind of bit of chat across the country. Now, of course, if you aren't, if you find that all just too confronting, you're very welcome to leave just when the um, formal, more formal conversation ends. But uh, we do encourage you to hang out if you hang, hang stay on and, and hang out if you um, would like to, even if you do feel slightly nervous, because it can be a great deal of fun in those rooms. Uh, but for now, I am just going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Alison McFadgen, who, along with uh, Emma Healy, has really been taking the lead on these online salons, and um, I'm really grateful to them for doing all of that work. So Ali's going to introduce our speakers for tonight, and Emma will be fielding the questions once they finish. So over to you, Ali, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Justine. So I'll start with April, who is an experienced urban planner and policy specialist with over 18 years working for government and also in the private sector in Australia, the UK and Ireland. Prior to joining CRED Consulting, she was the principal policy advisor to the Lord Mayor of Sydney, leading a team responsible for varied portfolio that spanned the city of Sydney's policy and operational areas and advising on a diverse individual policy portfolio. April is also the current co-chair of the PIA New South Wales Women in Planning Network and founder of Urbanists of Sydney, a woman-led network creating a space to connect and amplify the voice of women through the sharing of stories, ideas, and experiences to create a more inclusive and generous and interesting city. And now to Amelia. Amelia is an architect with over 25 years industry experience, over 20, 250 projects and largely in the residential sector. She started Undercover Architect in the mid 2014, which is an online business that helps and teaches homeowners, especially women, how to get it right when designing, building and renovating their family homes. Amelia does this via a podcast, blog and online courses and programs. Amelia's also set up a second business called Live Life Build, which she co-founded with a builder. They're working 
with builders to elevate the professionalism of the residential construction industry and help them improve their building businesses and lives. They have a large focus on collaboration between the designers and the builders and getting builders involved early so they can work closely with the designer and the client and advise on the buildability and cost during the design phase. Amelia is also passionate about design and the difference it makes and about making great design accessible to all. Thank you. Now I'll hand over to Amelia and April for their conversation. Thanks so much, Ali, and uh, thanks for the introduction and for having us here. This is actually, um, April and I don't know each other at all really, so we've just had the opportunity to touch base briefly before having this parlour and it's great to have everyone here. So Justine, I think I've already checked off that I've met someone I don't know, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to being able to uh, share this event with April. So um, diving right in, April, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and give us a brief summary of your career. Yeah, um, thanks, Amelia. And, and again, I was going to say, I, um, I ticked that box right up front there, <laughs> Justine, with Amelia. And there, is, there is a kind of a weird thing, as Justine put it, um, sort of meeting someone for the first time, but having an audience of people. So, um, so but uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks always to Parla for, for having me. I think, you know, there's always a bit of a joke there, the, the planner, into, in, um, you know, uh, sort of worming her way into the architectural sort of <laughs> conversation. So I really, I appreciate the love and, and that I get from, from everyone at Parla. So, um, so a bit about, about me. Um, I um, uh, originally from, from Newcastle. So I, I um, am a regional uh, New South Wales person uh my heart and uh I, i've lived in sydney and overseas as um as ali's lovely introduction there uh indicated um i think uh for me my my love of city started from um studying geography and doing um, human geography at university um and that was my first degree and so that sort of pushed me into once i started looking at um, places and I think it was uh, third year where I started to look at a subject around the memorial of places and how we experience different places. And I sort of thought, oh, this is interesting, something that I can kind of figure out, make a career of. So that's when I moved into planning. And, and I think for me, I've always sought, like I think that um, particularly for a lot of young people who might be on this call, you kind of, I think, start out with this, well, I certainly did with this kind of linear idea of a linear trajectory of my career. Um, and what's happened is it's become quite me meandering, which for those of you who know me is so not me. I'm not a meanderer. I don't like the journey. I'm all about the destination, really. <laughs> uh, but, but if I reflect on things, I'm actually really glad and really thankful that it has been meandering because it's meant that um, I have done some really sort of, I suppose, out of the box planning roles. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've worked in government, policy is my passion, um, and I think, you know, local government um, is really where, I think at any government level is where I, um, I find my place. I find that once you get beyond local government, um, the bureaucracy does start to kick in a little bit, and I remember sitting in a job where I was working for territory government, and I, I, I found myself actually just pushing paper and moving it from one thing to the next. Oh, wow. Uh, and that was a, quite an interesting realisation where I'd become a character in Utopia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I, you know, local government has been really great. But then, um, you know, I, I've worked in placemaking. It's been a really interesting space for me. And I think that um, you know, the, the idea of what placemaking is for me, I get really disappointed when I see it becomes this more place branding kind of thing, which has its place. But I think really, um, you know, those buzzwords that start to get attached to things and it starts to be the in thing and we lose what it actually means. Um, and then, as you mentioned, Ali, as, as Ali mentioned, I decided to throw myself into the world of politics. Um, again, from uni, I was always really interested in politics. Um, and I think, again, very, very lucky to work for someone like uh, Clover Moore, who is a champion for cities, um, who is a champion for open spaces. And so, you know, getting into that was really interesting. It certainly has its challenges. Um, 
it certainly has a limited shelf life, those sort of roles. Um, and then now I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with a great small business, which is women led. Um, we always say we're the sort of, we do the reverse um, gender, gender equity. We reverse it. <laughs> you bring in the token blokes. We, yeah, we bring in a, yeah, yeah, we were very excited to get a couple of uh, excellent colleagues who are male and just to sort of, you know, make sure that we're... Got to get the quotas, hey? We have to get the quotas, yeah, yeah. So um, I think I... I, I and um, so, yeah, so I, and now it's, it's um, uh, working with a company that's very values-driven, uh, which I feel really grateful to work with. We get to choose projects that align to our values and that we care about. We get to work with communities um, and really... Um, for us, the driver is a good job, building capacity, uh, making a difference. And I think that that for me is always been something that's driven my career. Um, and, and the reason why I started Urbanista is why I've been involved in the um, newly formed Women in Planning, um, the co-chair of that for New South Wales, because it is, I think, about putting back into a profession that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, but also too, for me, it's about providing the platform to amplify the voices of women. I think working in politics, working in planning, we don't have enough women in those decision-making roles. And we see and we see from all the great work Parler's done that as that age progression happens, we lose women out of our professions and we're losing those voices. And I think that we um, provide a different lens to decision-making and it's so important for those voices to be in a room. So. You know, it's, it's, it's being able to do that. And so that's the kind of stuff that drives me these days in terms of really promoting that, working with younger planners, um, particularly young female planners, to kind of show them that things can be done differently um, and their voice really matters. So that's, that's the five-second summary. <laughs> yeah. So no, I love it. I'm looking forward to diving into it in more detail. Yeah, me too. So I'm going to throw it back to you, Amelia. Um, I, uh, you know, the thing is that we don't know each other very well and we were told not to sort of, you know, uh, talk in between and, and, and put it out there in front of for all of you. So I want to know a bit more about you and, and your career and what drives you and um, what makes Amelia Lee tick. <laughs> um, well, I grew up in Sydney and I think it was about age 16, I figured out I wanted to do architecture. I actually went and did advertising for my work experience and thought everybody was a little bit weird. And, uh, and so architecture was just a really, I thought it was a really great marriage of something that was really creative and artistic and something that was very pragmatic, that there would be this built outcome of your, of your you know, sort of vision. So, and I, I grew up in a single parent household, my, and my mum was always up a, a ladder with a paintbrush. She's about five, just over five foot tall. And uh, so I'd seen her sort of very fiercely kind of changing our place on a regular basis. Every, every couple of years, the inside color would change, the outside color would change. I went to school on a Monday morning with paint in my hair because I would do the bottom half and she would do the top half of the wall. And so I think that was also, you know, it was very much, as a female saying that you could, you know, you could work in this space. She was dealing with tradespeople who would dismiss her because she was a single mother. They'd ask where her husband was, you know, they'd not want to work with her and these kinds of things. But she was just always tenacious in kind of making our home fantastic. And uh, she understood the core fundamentals of design in terms of finding Northern orientation and those kinds of things. So it was always sort of a sort of around me growing up. And um, I also think had a romantic idea that, you know, architecture would let you have children kind of at your feet under the table, <laughs> which, which hilariously I did do with my third child, but <laughs> straight off the bat wasn't necessarily that way. Um, and I studied, I did my degree at University of New South Wales and I started working part-time through my degree. So I did my six months out with a firm called Thomas Zalika. Uh, and then I uh, continued to work with them part-time through my degree and we were doing work on the Olympic site. So all of the oh. in-between spaces, the lighting towers that are down the main boulevard. And as a, as a 20 something working on a project that had a deadline that couldn't move, mm. uh, just was fascinating. It was just really amazing. Cause it just, it just put me in the deep end mm. and I had a fantastic learning experience and all of that also worked on customs house in circular key. And I've just always been really fortunate to have people around me who were willing to kind of take me under their wing and teach mm. me. So 
Um, I travelled overseas and then relocated to Brisbane after coming back from overseas. I met my now husband, who's also Australian, but he and I both worked in a summer camp in the north of New York State. And, uh, and so we uh, travelled one side of the States to the other and back and got together as a couple and I, we relocated to Brisbane coming back. And it was a great opportunity to have a fresh start in a city that was absolutely booming. It was about the year 2000. And um, I started working for some design firms and then I got a little bit jaded with the fact that it seemed that the person who was writing the cheque was the one who got to make decisions about what we got to design. And so I decided to do some postgraduate studies in property economics and got myself a job at Mervac Design, which at the time was called HPA, with the plan to move into development and to try and sort of sit at the table to help drive those decisions. And I found inside Mervac just a really great environment where we got to be at the table anyway, got to have really great design, great, great discussions around the value that design can add to a project. And you, I learned as an architect how important it was to be demonstrating the value of the design um, from a commercial sense, a construction sense, a streamlining sense, a, a saleability sense, as much as a livability sense. And it was just a really, you know, there was a mantra that the project is king. And so all of these competing agendas really working to elevate the quality of the project. And um, I just had a fantastic time there, got to see lots of work built, got to spend a lot of time on site. And uh, Mervac went through a big sh um, a shift in, in response to the GFC. So I, um, I went on maternity leave with my first child, came back, completely changed my role coming back to Mervac after maternity leave. I was then coordinating the and programming the workflow of the 100 strong architectural team at that point. So I could work from home, I could bring a baby into the office, you know, those kinds of things. I was really fortunate again that I had a male boss who was just really passionate about me staying in the workforce and he really facilitated me being able to do a role that worked with some flexibility. And so, and I just changed tack on what I did and learned how to use um, a big programming piece of software so that we could really manage the workflow of all of the various teams inside Mervac Design. And then when the GFC hit, they made a decision they were going to downsize all of their staff and centralise back to the Sydney office. And a group of us got offered national positions. And, um, and I did toy with it for a while to um, move to Sydney and um, start working in the Sydney office. Um, but instead, uh, a group of us decided to start our own architectural practice. So there were six of us in total from um, Mervac Design who went out on our own and formed a business called DC8 Studio. And we literally started in a, a little worker's cottage on Caxton Street in Paddington. I think by the end of that year, we were starting to bust out of it and needed to relocate. I'd had my second baby by this time and was actually... Um, my third was born sort of a year into DC8 studio. So that practice whilst I was there built to about 20 staff and had a studio in Brisbane and Sydney. And it was around the beginning of 2000 and uh, I'm trying to think 2013. I had a couple of personal things kind of go pear shaped and it really sort of, my kids were very little at the time, sort of uh, I think two, four and six. And I started sort of thinking is hang on, I'm part of this architectural practice. Is this what I wanted to do? It sort of seems the penultimate kind of goal as an architect that you build your career, particularly as a female, you know, that's what is it, 1% of positions in, direct positions in architectural practice as a female. So I was, here I was, I was a director of a, you know, an architectural practice, but I kind of felt I wasn't really living my dream. And um, and so I uh, signed up to a Business Chicks and the Hunger Project Leadership and Immersion Program, which involved fundraising $10,000 and then funding your trip to go to one of the epicenters that the Hunger Project is working in. And the Hunger Project believes in, it's a not-for-profit that believes in ending hunger and poverty. The key to it lies with those that are hungry and poor by empowering them through education mm -hmm. to really change um, their, their lives. And it focuses on working with women because they see when they help women, it creates generational change. So it was really amazing. I you know, fundraised with a friend who was also going with me, went on this trip and it literally picked up my life, chucked it on the floor and said, okay, what else are you going to pick up? And uh, I got home from that trip and um, my husband and I had been talking about moving to the Byron hinterland for about nine or 10 years. We'd been renovating houses in Brisbane as a means of um, being able to sort of both work from home, work part-time, juggle having kids, not need to put them in childcare. So we'd lived in construction sites. We'd done three renovations. I had a baby per renovation. They all learned to climb ladders before they walked. You know, it was this sort of, we were constantly living in construction sites. The last one had been a hundred square meter house. We turned into something that was over 400 square meters to meet the market. And my husband had pretty much done all the building work himself. And yeah, I, I got 
back from this trip and said, we're never going to have enough, what we think is enough money to move. We're never, it's never going to be the right time for us to leave a CBD location. Let's just do it. Let's stop delaying the dream. Yeah. I told my business partners I needed to leave and they very graciously enabled me to stay on until the end of the financial year of the following year. And in that time, I madly panicked about what I was going to do about next. And I looked everywhere else but architecture. And, um, and for somebody very wise said to me, you know what, your skills in architecture aren't easily replicable. You should look at something to do with that. And I thought about the model of uh, empowerment through education and how that applied to my industry and how well I'd seen it working in the hunger project and what I could translate across to, you know, sort of everyday life. And I just felt like I'd had so many conversations with people at the school gate or at a barbecue where they just told me some horror story about their project gone wrong or you'd wander through a house and see how poorly it had been designed and I just knew they'd just not got the information that they needed to at the right time that they needed to get it yeah. and uh, we we started looking for property we moved to the Byron hinterland at the um, pretty much at the point of me exiting DC8 studio and um, and I thought if I try and set up an architectural practice in the Byron region, there's a lot of architects around here. I'm going to be <laughs> traveling to sites all the time. I'm going to be away from my kids. Yeah. You know, they were still very little and I just wanted to be able to work more flexibly and impact more people, you know, not just be doing kitchens and decks for one person at a time. Mm. I felt like I had this professional and personal experience that was really valuable um, in terms of being able to assist and help people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Undercover Architect began from that sort of idea. Its, re its mission really was to educate um, first and foremost. And so I started blogging, figured out how to build a website, figured out how to do all of those kinds of things. And then um, I was, at that time, I was doing design services over Skype. So oh, I, right. you know, I just help people design their homes remotely. So, and, so you, um, pivoted, you pivoted before everyone even knew what the word <laughs> pivot was. Yeah. yeah, it was a selfish desire to be able to work from home. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, dear. Classic. Yeah. No, I, I should have got you in a bit earlier. I'm trying to renovate a, an apartment at the moment. And yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not my favourite thing, I have to say. No, and that's the thing. It's one of these things I think I've learned so much more about homeowners and the renovation and building, you know, journey as undercover architect than I ever did as working with them as their client, you know, as having them as a client. And so it's really fascinating to see what an emotional journey it is for people who are overwhelmed, who haven't done it before, mm. you know, and, um, and just don't even know where to turn and who to trust and, mm. you know, those kinds of things. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Now, can I ask you about your, I'm really fascinated about the fact, you know, when I think of planning, I think of the physical work of, you know, master planning and, you know, thinking large scale about sort of the, the structure and the layout of, of places and placemaking in general. Mm. And yet there's also so many constructs that actually drive sort of how we think about creating places and what we need to know about you know I saw your Instagram posts about uh, your disappointment with the, some of the questions in the census and you know the collect the collation of data that we have that drives some of this decision making and obviously your career has shifted to be much more around strategic planning and you know policy development what's actually like how can you talk through sort of I suppose, leaving that traditional idea of planning and moving more into that strategic policy development. Also, you know, how that then played out inside. You spoke a bit about politics, but mm. I'm fascinated how you kind of express your professional expertise inside a political environment where you're dealing with a bunch of different agendas as well. <laughs> with a lot of frustration at times. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I think I, I liked your, your comment about an architect and being creative and practical. And I think that um, it's a really fine balance for policy as well is there's a there's a creativity to policy and to that it's creative thinking but there's a practicality to it I think um, I've never come at planning from a really traditional point of view so I did my degree at um, UNE so in Arbordale and Armadale's course is very different to UNSW UNSW looks more at the function of planning whereas I think what appealed to me at at um, UNE was it's a broader um, it, it gives you a bit of a taster of everything and it's about that broad thinking it's about policy it's about architecture urban design it's thinking around that you do your standard how to write a DCP and all those sort of things but it is, it is mainly that thing and I, I it's funny um, having a conversation recently 
um, with someone. I, I'm kind of like this knowledge bowerbird. I, I kind of have this curiosity and it's very easy for me to, to dive into a rabbit hole just because I've read something I like. So I start to, to move in. And I think that's what policy does. It allows you to kind of see things from a different point of view. And I think that my frustrations with, well, one, I'm not a, a development, I've never done, de oh, sorry, I've done half an hour of development assessment in my entire career and I hated it. And so I faked a meeting and said, I've got to go somewhere else. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs> um, I think I love, I love the stories. I love the conversations as a strategic planner you have with people. I don't like the confrontation about, um, uh, and this is where the politics, my frustration started to get because you have, you know, arguments about whether a setback should be this wide or this wide. And, and it's, it is, it's an important part of it. But for me, it's just not what I'm built for. Um, I, I'm, I'm built for those bigger policy strategic, my brain works as a, in that strategic way. I like to talk to people about what their experience is um, of cities and how then as policymakers, we translate that experience into something practical that's achievable you know it's it's the it's it's not falling in the trap of creating cities for everyone because if you try and do that then you're going to create it for no one but it's also coming from it's but it's coming from a place of saying cities are experienced by so many different people in so many different ways how do we support those experiences to happen without curating those experiences and i think sometimes in built environment we fall into this trap of we know we'll we'll sort of make this public space look like this and have these things because this is what we think it's it's the OJ uh, goat track i always love that one we put a footpath somewhere and then you see the goat track happening and rather than going back and saying well let's put let's either not put a path there or just let people kind of do their own we're trying to force them back onto a way we want it and so as much as I think I see for me, um, I think for me, the, uh, the policy also, I think a lot of people see policy as being this sort of vacuous, wishy-washy, a whole bunch of buzzwords that are thrown in together. And I think what I really look at with policy is the, that words have real power and meaning and it's an invitation to people. And I was talking to a client today and I was saying, you know, we want a library to, to be welcoming. And I use the word purposely because you actually want the strategy to be an invitation for people to say, this is your place. And so if you put a word like safe, it has different meanings for different people. Um, and so it's, it's really trying to understand that. And I think, so being able to, to take and go and talk to a community. And I think something in planning that we're getting better at doing is valuing the expertise and the voice of the community. And I think, seeing that as such a valuable input. And um, I know a lot of my colleagues will, will laugh and, you know, I love having a good old yarn with, I was in Inverell and I was having a yarn with Bev who was telling me that back in the sort of 60s, she was in the planning department at council, hand coloring zoning maps. Oh, and then wow. after she'd finished five of them, because, you know, five different government departments needed it. Um, there was a big flood that came through the town and her boss called her and said, you know, those maps that you colored. Yep. They were like, you know, they're watercolored now. So, uh, you know, it's, it's so, but you find these stories because you, you can have these conversations with people. And then I see my job as it's a real privilege because people will tell me these things. Tell, people will tell me what their aspirations is for their place. It's a really personal thing. And if I'm doing my job well enough, then I can drag and, and draw that out of people. And then it's my job to translate that into the practical. How do we balance the needs for that community good, that public benefit? And I suppose that's why governments always appeal to me as well. There's a, there is a meaning in the word public servant and not in the utopia and the yes, prime minister, public servant, but in the actual true sense of you are there to protect the public benefit. They're, they're your clients. Um, and so how do we then take that and take what they've told us? How do we then translate that into something that is deliverable, that is, um, is equitable? Um, and so, I, you know, working with Cred and while I've moved into the more policy planning spaces, it's something I always gravitated to anyway. And, you know, I still love talking about planning and planning frameworks and, you know, my poor partner will just 
just shut down when I start talking like that. Um, I'm sure most of you on this call, your partners, if they're not in the biz, do the same thing. <laughs> um, but it's, it's um, social planning, there's a, it brings in that equity. It brings in the gender, uh, you know, recently we did this great piece of work with the City of Sydney and C40 Women for Climate, researching women in active transport and what is the barrier for women to use cycling and walking as a primary mode of transport. And so we actually got to go along, we, one of our research methods was to go along with women on their journey. And for the first time, and you know, after four and a half years with Clover, um, one of my old colleagues was horrified to know that that was the first time I ever got on a bike and rode the city <laughs> cycleways. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was amazing to, to, to be able to immerse yourself in that experience and have that experience and that be a part of influencing then what are the recommendations for policymakers to actually then encourage women. So it's, it's this, it's, I, th I think for me, um, what drew me there is, is, is this, this immersive kind of ex ability to go and explore things and, um, and to have conversations. And cities are complex because they're, they're made by humans, but that's the fun bit. That's the untangling. That's the bit that we've got to figure out. You know, one of the things I really want to do is, is, get 20 people to, to take a photo of the same spot in a city and tell me what their experience of that city and how they use it. Because this multi-layer and multi-faceted is what makes planning really interesting. And then I think the politics is again, that, that passion of, uh, of women. Like I was really lucky to work um, with some amazing women in Clover's team. I mean, Clover Moore is, is known. She's probably the most well-known Lord Mayor in, in Australia. Definitely. Um, and, and really dynamic and, and really interesting, but she also has these amazing women um, around her as well. And I was, I was at the City of Sydney at a time when 70% of that council was women. Oh, wow. And so, and like you, Amelia, where you said, I've been so lucky to work with managers and bosses who are women, colleagues who, uh, who are these amazing um, passionate women and so I've I suppose for me that privilege of working with them and really wanting to make sure that those voices because I know their voices matter and they've got some amazing ideas but 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 for whatever reason there's always these little barriers to not being able to see and so I think with the politics side of things it is that challenge of being creative and practical and it's about learning to fight the fights and then set aside the stuff that you just go, I can't do the energy on. It's also the ability to, um, and it's very easy when you work with a politician whose values align pretty closely with yours. Like, I don't think I could work. I moved to Canberra after I moved back from law. I say moved back from the UK. My visa got screwed up and, you know, I had to go through all that palaver that is visa applications and it didn't work out. And I moved to Canberra, potentially in the, in the hope of working in politics, because it, it was, you know, I was a member of the Australian Democrats at uni. And so Natasha stopped to spoil years. So, um, yeah. wow. And, and so, but I couldn't find a politician that I worked with. And I think, you know, one of the things I hear from you, Amelia, when you talk, there's this, there's this desire for a meaningful kind of work existence. And I can't, I could never work for a politician that I went out and sold something that I didn't believe in either. I'm not, I'm not that good a liar. I'm really not that good a liar. Um, so it was hard. I think it's amazing though. You, you must be able to release like, <coughs> excuse me, the whole thing of, of being strategic and not being prescriptive about mm. what people create with those spaces. Like the control freak in me goes, Oh, hang on. I'm not sure I could unleash you know, mm. I, it, I've done all this research, we've done all these behavioural studies, we've spent all this time immersing ourselves mm. in the research to drive this strategy, but yep. then we're going to leave it up to others to interpret that, to then make good decisions that may or may not be in alignment with achieving the results that we were hoping to achieve. Like, mm. how have you reconciled <laughs> that bit? A lot of therapy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but um, no, look, it, it is like planners. I think planners and architects have a very similar thread where we're control freaks and, and we like the way we like it. I think it's taken a long time for me to be comfortable and sort of say, um, because I think also too, as a placemaker, we look at, we look at places that work and all those places that work are all ones that 
that haven't been planned or designed in the inch of their life. <laughs> it's it's the places that people it's the reason why tactical urbanism has become such a, a big and popular thing because people get to make and remake cities and I think you know one of the things in possibly the planning and the politics you know David Harvey's work on the on um and and, and on the politics of public space and and all those sort of things the rights of the city and one of my favorite quotes of his is he talks about the right to remake to make and remake the city is one of the most important human rights but the one that we use the least mm. and i think that as architects and planners we have a responsibility to reflect a general like reflect community and generosity in the places and i think sometimes we get caught up in the best looking like I, I am like a design nerd I'll walk around cities and I'll take photos of buildings and go oh, I love that one I hate that one oh, I love that one but it's actually what happens in between the buildings and on the ground plane that's the fun bit that's the bit that people connect with that's the the people that seek solace that's the bit that that we all kind of interact with no matter from little kids you know it's the the thing where kids see water and they run to it it's how do we get people to really feel the city? I think is kind of like a, you know, I've been listening to way too much Brene Brown in this lockdown, I have to say, but <laughs> it's, it's all that. So yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot there. And I think that's what strategy for me is it's, it's being able to see it as a whole and have all these, these threads that come in. Um, if I don't, I get bored and that's not a nice place for anyone around me if I'm bored. No, I love it because it just must be so dynamic as a result in terms of where your research is, the things that you're kind of studying and implementing and yeah, just must be really, yeah, very yeah. dynamic. Yeah. And I mean, I think back to you as well, like one of the things when I was stalking you on LinkedIn and Google and things like that, um, all in a very nice and well-mannered way, <laughs> um, so it, you know, what I really liked is through your career, there's this really kind of sort of social justice thread that runs through a lot of the stuff you do, whether it's a, the hunger project, the, the, the education, the kind of sharing knowledge stuff um, and with, uh, with undercover architects. So I've got two questions. One, why undercover architect? I like the name and I want to know why. Mm -hmm. um, it feels a bit James Bondy to me, so I want to <laughs> know why. But also to like, you know, what, what drives your involvement in those sort of projects and that social justice, but also to, you know, that, that education part of undercover architects, what's, what's, what drives that? What's, where are you sort of sitting and how do you drive meaning from that? Also to where the hell do you find the time to do it with like children and everything else? Uh, well, I'll speak to that one first. I have an incredibly supportive husband and we're both at home and uh, he does the lion's share of a lot of stuff. So yeah, so I could not do this without him. Undercover Architect exists in the way that it does purely because I have him as my husband. So, mm. um, and uh, I also have three very patient kids who know that <laughs> mum is usually on a computer or a phone. So, <laughs> um, uh, and um, in terms of why Undercover Architect, I look, I looked at different names. I looked at naming it, you know, Amelia Lee Architecture, those kinds of things, but I kind of felt there was a lot of ego there is often a lot of ego associated with the arena of architecture and mm. naming it after myself just didn't seem to support an idea that this was about equalizing, leveling the playing field, you know, giving people access to good information and um, undercover architect was really about being your secret ally. So oh, nice. it was about this thing of, you know, I have lots of people who are members of my online programs who I've worked with one-to-one uh, -one, who have never told their designer or architect or builder that they were, you know, part of the undercover architect um, community and uh, are just able to show up as entirely different people for mm. their homes as a result of kind of what they've learned and the way that we've worked together. Mm. And, uh, you know, I did have somebody say to me very early on the fact that you kind of try to be an undercover architect may mean that it becomes a self-perpetuating um, thing in terms of nobody's sort of sharing with others that they've been using your business, but it's um, it's actually been the reverse. And I, I love this idea of being people's secret ally because like I said, I get different information than I ever got from them as their architect. And I think that the social justice thing, I don't know, I was just raised in a house where if you 
if you don't believe something's right, you need to step in and help change it. You can't mm. complain about things if you're not going to be trying to be part of the solution. Mm. And I had a mum who worked full time, but always managed to squeeze everything else in as well and just managed to get so much done with her day. She still gets, she's in her seventies and still does renovations to the properties that she lives in. So yeah. um, she's just a little firecracker. So, um, and yeah, I just think that, I think education is just the greatest equalizer that we have generally. And, um, and for me seeing the power of it in the, you know, the work that the hunger project was doing and the change it was making not only to people's lives, but to their whole demeanor and their sense of pride. And, you know, just, and I, I remember an experience being, you know, I think what was really confronting was when I was in Uganda, we would get taken from village to village and location to location. And we'd travel with translators. There was a group of about 25 women and, you know, most of us very white and walking into these African villages. And um, they, they just had, um, such a sense of personal accountability in the way that they were uh, creating these new lives for themselves. Yeah. And there was one woman that I met in particular who um, she came to talk to me and I was having a conversation with her and <clears throat> I was asking her the standard questions that I asked all of the people that I met. And um, I remember she had a tiny child beside her and another child on her back. And I asked her the ages of her kids and the, at, at that time, I think my kids were, um, you know, sort of three, five and seven from memory. Mm. And so that her, the one standing beside it was four and my two-year-old was about the same size. And the one on her back was um, 18 months and my babies were about the same size at nine months. And I thought this is what hunger and poverty looks like when it's been happening for generations. And yet this woman was standing in front of me wanting to tell me how she was growing food for a family. These were two of eight children that she had. She was also supporting five extended family members. She was growing crops. She was putting them through school. She was doing all of these things. And I was standing there going, holy cow, I've had every opportunity, every, you know, managed to go to private school, have a tertiary education, you know, everything laid out to me, every privilege that I can access. And yet I'm putting all these excuses in front of myself as to why I can't do the things that I say I want to do or help in the way that I want to help. And it was just the, you know, and there was this sliding door moments of realizing mm. I could so have easily been born where she was standing and she'd be born where I was standing, mm. you know? And so I think, I know that definitely that trip really reignited something in me. And I have a mantra that I run Undercover Architect by, which is a rising tide floats all boats. I am passionate about collaboration over competition. I just think that uh, when I operate like that, I attract the right kinds of people uh, to Undercover Architect and I attract the right kinds of colleagues and, and you know, people that I bring into the Undercover Architect community to introduce to my members and things like that through the podcast. And it's just uh, to me a much... I don't know. I just feel like we have so many gifts and opportunities yeah. in terms of where we get to live and yeah. we've really won the birth lottery. And I look at my kids and I'm like, you hit the jackpot turning up in, you know, they might not think that, but you hit the jackpot <laughs> turning up in our house. Yeah. Um, you know, we all, we have an obligation. We really yeah. do. We have an obligation. It's, so. it's really, and I think that's the thing, a lot of colleagues, female colleagues, but male colleagues <clears> as well, but um, there's this, there's this feeling. And I, I think that's why I love working with younger planners. I feel this obligation that I had, these, I look back and some women who were planners just in other areas that I worked with who have really shaped um, in a really positive way parts of my career. And, that, and I think that there's that real, um, you know, I love that sort of feeling of responsibility and also recognising that privilege and, and kind of doing good with that. And, and I agree with you. Like in politics for me, power, you see things that power is in the knowledge I hold and this is maybe where I differ because for me, power is in the knowledge we share. And yep, that, I totally agree. And yep. I think, and it's more fun. It's more interesting. And you can have a good old yarn like this. Like this is why this, this community is so great because you, um, when we were actually able to travel and we're down at symposium there, you know, the, the chatting that was happening is, I don't know how Justin controlled the crowd to be honest, but <laughs> it's, it's that catalyzing of ideas and ways we do things. So I think that's great. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Can I talk to you about, cause I'm fascinated that you work for a female uh, led business yep. and how that sort of changes your whole experience of your working life and even the kind of work, like the way that you work, you mentioned that, you know, you work with a business that's aligned with your values. Mm. I know you're really passionate about gender equity and mm. I'm 
curious sort of how you see that playing out perhaps differently to what it might be in the industry of architecture and mm. what your personal experiences of working inside that female led business. Yeah, look, I mean, I think for me, as I said, I've been really lucky that um, I've had a number of people who have supported me in different stages of my career. And so I, I always felt that there was opportunity available to me. I think what's interesting is that planning is dealing with a different issue. and we're, we're currently writing or trying to get through a national equity policy, the first one for planning um, through PEA, is that when you look at the numbers, planning is almost 50-50 female male. And so it's a really hard base to start with, well, why do we need a gender equity policy? And when you don't have the data sitting there, fascinating. Yeah. when you don't have the data and it's all anecdotal and it's all survey of people saying, I'm, I, I feel I've worked in this industry for 10 years and it feels like a boys club and I don't have space at the decision making table. And it's, it's all experience based. Um, and so that's a really hard place to start. But I think it's what was interesting for me was even just looking at the peer membership data. 20% of, of um, members who are in retirement are female and 80% are mm -hmm. male. And we're losing nice. this amazing knowledge that, that can younger planners can actually, and even myself still a kind of younger planner can, can derive from because we have, you know, we, the women in planning network this year had our first women in planning awards. Um, and it was named after Helen Proudfoot um, who was um, instrumental in uh, the conservation of heritage, some, some significant heritage buildings like the Sandstone buildings at Sydney Uni and other places. No one knew oh, wow. who she was. And so yeah. it's, 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 I think that visibility part is really, I think planning, the visibility of women in planning is really limited. I think that that's the bit that we start with. So I think that it's, we have different challenges. Um, in, in planning, but I think that it's no less important. Um, the architects are a lot, architecture is a lot further um, than us in planning to really sort of inform that gender equity conversation and we're at the beginning. So, and I think it's, it's important that our professions reflect that equity because we're working with communities and that's what we're advocating for. We're advocating for equity in our communities that we're working in, whether it's equity of access of, you know, social equity, gender equity, um, you know, cultural diversity and, and seeing those, the, you know, so I think that having professions that really show, it's as simple as having, you know, at least one woman, one woman on a panel, for God's sake, like, uh, you know, when someone says, oh, but, but these people were experts, and it's like, yeah, well, I'm sure you could probably find if you looked at a female, I think we're not very good at planners in as a whole aren't great at promoting ourselves and what we do um i'm probably one of the louder ones but uh which i'm sure doesn't come as a big surprise um <laughs> but i think as women we need to be better at, at at really kind of um showing and being visible about our expertise as well so oh definitely and i think too giving each other a shout out as mm. well you know it's that thing of if you're seeing somebody sort of needing a network or needing something, you know, a particular expert on something, putting forward another woman's name, yeah. you know, so that there's this whole kind of issue around that visibility and uh, the argument that, well, we don't just don't know, you know, who these yeah. people are. And so yeah. it's that thing of if we can all, you know, tap into our own little black books and put forward names that we know that can definitely help things along. Yeah, it's that story from the Obama White House where, you know, women, they would back each other up in meetings so there was less mansplaining and things like that. And yeah. it's those you think of a White House like Obama and expect it to be this nirvana of equity and um, and even they had to make up, really figure out strategies to kind of really support each other. And I think we are our, we are each other's best cheerleaders. And I think that that's, you know, um, that's totally kind of uh, one of the things and why Urbanistas, why I wanted to do that, why I love working with Parlour, because I think that's very much what we're doing in that space. So, yeah. Quick question for you, because I know that we're running out of time and, and okay. um, we, we did warn Emma, Ali and Justine, it was going to be hard to wind us up. Us but <laughs> what I'm really interested in, I think that um, you work, 
really outside and it seems to me you've really worked outside that established architecture world um and which i love and i think that's that's you know one of the things that probably um when we started talking was going oh this is this is the right person to me i have a conversation with but and i suppose what do you see as being the advantages of doing that for i think you personally and what you're able to bring to to sort of the people you work with but also to what do you think is some of the, the ways that you are creating those positive impacts for people by, you know, not, not doing the norm, not doing the BAU. Yeah. It's um, it's been a really interesting, it's like you said, I, my career feels like it's meandered. It doesn't feel like it's been deliberate or linear in any way, shape or form. I have found that things have tacked and changed as my lifestyle has kind of called for it, or I've not been in alignment with the people that I've been working with, um, or not felt that I was really getting to kind of do the kinds of things that I enjoyed or really felt that I could contribute um, mm. with. And um, I think once I had kids, that just really kind of helped me reassess a lot of stuff in terms, you know, I often say I spent so long becoming an architect and have worked so hard to establish a career in architecture that um, I didn't want to throw it all away when I had kids um, or have it relegated to being sort of this thing around, I don't know, this, this kind of... Um, I didn't want it to just be something that I sort of just let go of. Mm. Um, and I, but I knew that any time I was spending away from my kids had to be making a big impact. I had to feel like I was making a big valuable contribution so that that time away from them was meaningful. And, mm. um, and so, yeah, I think that I've, you know, I have been really fortunate to work with great people, but I also felt like when I was working at DC8 studio and I had these, you know, fantastic business partners, but I was given a fair, quite a lot of flexibility in terms of the fact I had small babies and I, you know, my third child, she came into work from when she was about two days old and would sit on the floor when I was in the office two or three days a week until she could start crawling at eight months and could start turning off the computers that were on the floor. And, um, you know, and I worked from home a lot and I worked in the evenings a lot and I was given a lot of grace in that regard. But there was this sort of feeling that once my kids were at school, I was going to have to start working full time. And that just hadn't ever been part of my agenda. My husband and I have really sort of shaped a lifestyle through the renovating, you know, and those kinds of things. It's been about being able to be both available for our kids. And, mm. um, and I think that going out on my own and creating Undercover Architect, it became very apparent to me very quickly that I was going to have to detach my sense of achievement and accomplishment from the finished building oh. and the result in the jewel of the building yep. and attach it instead to the experience that a homeowner was having through that journey of creating it. And I'd sat across the table from enough builders and developers who'd said, look, the client's not going to pay for more. We're not going to bother delivering it. You know, it's not going to matter. We're not going to earn more money from it. And I, I just felt like I needed to empower these homeowners to know they could demand better from the industry that they were working with. Most of them only do these, these kinds of projects once or twice in their life. They're staking either a life of savings or a 30 year mm. mortgage on it. I just felt they deserved better and we were capable of giving better. And, um, and so it was really that process of seeing how could I teach particularly women who, you know, making 80% of the purchasing decisions, working, walking into a male dominated industry, telling me that they feel like they're walking around with a target on their forehead, waiting to be taken advantage of, mm. and yet holding all of their hopes and dreams and aspirations and ambitions for their future, you know, as they entrust it to whoever they're working with. Mm. And I just felt that they deserved a better opportunity. And so, yeah, being able to really pull apart and it's hard because architecture is such an identity thing, you know, mm. like, Whenever somebody, I still define myself as an architect and then people, then I have, I have, uh, I have a lot of support inside the architectural industry. I also get a lot of criticism inside the architectural industry and I have architects telling me that I don't design buildings and I don't know what I'm talking about. I need to spend more time on site and I've got no clue and I'm telling people to not use architects and all of this kind of stuff. But I just know that the more I teach people mm. about design and about what good design is, they realize that it's actually a complicated thing to achieve and it requires a lot of skill to do a good job of it. And I've had that many people say to me, I'm only using an architect because I learned from you that, mm. you know, that this is bigger than I thought it was and it has more meaning than I thought it did. So I love it. And I love that there are thousands, you know, my podcast has hit a million downloads this week. I saw that this week. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. So there are thousands of people all around the country who I will never meet mm. who are 
who are changing the way that their home is and the lifestyle that it'll create for them because of what they've learned. Yeah. And they've been able to access that information for free. I just think it's too valuable, uh, you know, how we live in our houses this and the houses we create impacts all of us it builds the suburbs and the streets around us yeah. when we live in homes that work for us it means yeah. that we get to walk out each day showing up as the best version of ourselves mm. to me that creates societal change and so yeah i just want to help people make that easier for people oh it's just i mean there's just so much in there i mean you know the i i really resonate when you say attaching your identity to a built product or something and i think for all of us it is really hard because it's the the meaning the the value in a conversation the the value in um understanding some walking in someone's shoes like that yeah. has no tangible kind of product that you can hold up and say you know this is this is kind of the definition of productivity because this is what i did but it's it's for me like so one of my favorite things in the Lord Mayor's office was we used to get um, letters from kids and it was mainly young girls. And it was my favorite thing. It got to the point where my team realized, oh, we got a letter from a kid. Just give it to April. She'll, she'll want to deal with it. <laughs> because it was these kids who said, dear Lord Mayor Clovermore, I had a, a chat with my friends and here are some designs for some play equipment that we really oh, want to use. They didn't wow. use the word equipment. Yeah. And, and so I took that letter, I wrote a letter, like I didn't send it off to our correspondence people. I wrote the letter responding to them. I followed up with the design team and said, Hey, we've got this. And I was a letter I put in front of Clover. And so, cause obviously she gets a stack of correspondence. Oh, she only excellent. signs That's a certain amazing. amount. And I remember yep. the first time I put it in front of her, she goes, Oh, why am I signing this one? I'm just going, please just sign it for me. It's really important. And for me, being able to, and, and you get a letter back usually or an email back from their parents saying, thank you so much. She was so excited and she got a letter from the board yep. there. And it's, it's those, those things that for me have the greatest meaning. And one of them was my favourite because this, this father sent an email and said, Lord Mayor, my, we were walking through the street the other day and my, um, my daughter asked me, why is a little um, green men men? why aren't they ladies? And so, and she was, and, and he said, she was actually quite outraged about the fact that they were, they weren't ladies, they were men. So yes. I had to do all this research. And of course, in the politics and the bureaucracy of state government in New South Wales, it's, it's too, we don't have enough time and enough wine, even when Justine over orders, we don't have enough wine to get through why they can't be women or something like that. But, but being able to to take and and send a letter back to a small child to say your voice matters and i'm going to say i'm going to take the time and send it was for me the most fun bit of the job i did that was the fun that bit. sounds amazing yeah. um and look yeah it's great to kind of indoctrinate them into the politics pretty early you know you get you start <laughs> to build the voter connection pretty early but you know <laughs> but still it's it's like you, you can kind of do that and i think that's that's such a there's nothing, there's no tick box or there's no evidence to go. That's really important. But I think it's, it's some of the important stuff we do. And it's the same with you empowering people to be able to, you know, when I have to deal with tradies, I put on my Newcastle accent because it <laughs> yeah. sounds like that, you know, I'm from a family of tradies and I know what I'm talking about. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's amazing. I hate to cut this conversation off because it's so delightful. Um, that story about the kids, um, the letter to the little kids. That's so sweet. Thank you. Isn't that sensational. <laughs> I loved it. And I, I wasn't sure where your, your talks would, um, or where the connection would be and the link would be, but I really think the fact that you just both really want to understand people better and not curate their experiences and let people enjoy the built environment and be empowered in it is a real connection that I was that was unexpected for me so thank you so much um Amelia and April it was brilliant um we do have a few questions um Claire 
Bowles asked a question but had to leave, but I might just read it out. Mm -hmm. It was for April. Um, she said, how can we integrate the ecological uniqueness of a place into policy so people can connect with and be part of a living system of both people and other living beings? So I, I see uh, Laura on the call and she's going to love this. It's called a thing called, have you heard of biophilic design? Uh, <laughs> so one of, one of the other great things I'm involved with is with the um, uh, living, uh, is it living future? I always get them mixed up. Living future Australia. Yep. Yeah, okay. I always get it, <laughs> the words mixed up on the biophilic design advisory panel. And I think that um, how we create that feeling of nature and we embed that not just with a pot plant in the corner, but something more intrinsic within our built form is really important down to the materials we use or how we kind of work with you know, I think Indigenous, as we're learning more and more about connection to country and that spiritual connection to country and how we work, you know, that we work with rather than impose on. I think mm -hmm. that's, there's some really big lessons and we're, we're all still learning a lot. And I think there's been some, some really important sort of um, steps around um, greener places in New South Wales and um, designing for country and things like that. I think there's something really um in there i think it comes back to rather than us imposing everything on let's just sort of try and find that balance a bit more so um yeah uh, yeah that's brilliant thanks april um we're getting a lot of comments saying that people have to go but they really enjoyed the discussion and um we did have someone asking if there was somewhere they could see your research around active transport that you were talking about, April. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah, sure. I'll um uh I will try and find the link and throw it into the chat. Um, but also to it is available, I think, on the City of Sydney's website. So if you just type in women and active transport, you should be able to find it. But let me see if I can find the find the link. That's awesome. Thank you. And Jess has said, just imagine if living infrastructure had the same statutory recognition and value as the dead stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Jesse had a question for each of you, I think. I was wondering if Jesse wanted to come off mute and maybe introduce yourself and where you are and ask, well, maybe both your questions, Jesse, if you're there. Well, I'm happy to really go to over one of the questions because I didn't want to hog the questions. Um, but uh, I was really interested in um, tactical urbanism, um, April. And uh, yeah, I was just wondering like how, or if you knew more about how to get into that being in Australia. Um, I mean, I don't really know too much about like the rest of the world, but I would imagine it would be sometimes be easier in places that have less policy on public space. Yeah, look, I think you're, you're seeing a lot more of it. Like parking day is a perfect example of a tactical kind of a, it's, it's, um, I think that my favourite one is, is um, kids in, in Bayside Council have kind of created their own um, bike, whatever, you know, the, are they called pub tracks or something. I don't have kids, so I don't know, but the, you know, they go and make their own stuff. So I think there's that. I think that there um, a lot of uh, smaller groups uh, you know, I think it's it's those are the groups that are sort of um, pulling together um, different tactical urbanism type projects. I think governments, um, parklets for another example, um, a friend of mine is, is doing some really great work in that space. Um, and I think it's, for me, I, I like the, the political side of it because it's people reclaiming space that might be there for cars or something like that. So. Yeah, look, it is it is tough. Um, it is tough, and and in Australia, and I think that one of the things a, a colleague, Mike Lydon, in the US, said that the GFC was the best thing for the US in terms of having to do more with what you already had because you can't afford to do and just add, keep adding things, and that's where better blocks and those other sort of um, movements started to happen because you had to find a way to reuse vacant spaces or reactivate spaces. Christchurch is doing some great stuff in terms of that tactical um, side of things, um, trying to re, 
uh, reimagined spaces after the earthquake and what um, people are using for. My favourite one is the dance floor, the old laundromat dance floor um, that they do. So I think it's 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 haphazard um, and it's really community led. It's really community led. So that's the that's the fun bit about it. Awesome. Thanks. Um, uh, should I go over to my other question? I guess I'll go over there. <laughs> Um, so the other one was to Amelia, um, and I, I suppose this in a sense, I've had like similar conversations to architects and all that about it, just like how they convince people that their services are worthwhile. Um, and I was wondering how you convince people to um, pay the money for the undercover architect course, um, especially to people who don't know much about the industry, you know, how do you convince them that it's going to be worth their time? Um, during the course? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a good question. Um, I, um, I found that I, for the first couple of years of Undercover Architect, the only way that I was earning money was via um, doing Skype consults and design services over Skype with people remotely. Um, but at the same time, I was blogging on a weekly basis. And I found that I never had to market those design services because people would be Googling about renovating and building. They would land on my website. They would start reading this educational, helpful information. And they'd self-select to see whether I was kind of speaking along the lines of the way that they were thinking about their home or it seemed helpful. And then they would reach out to me. And so I just found that through being generous and educating people, um, that that has always been the key to helping people see whether this is going to be a good fit to work with me in this way. Um, the design services, obviously, they kept growing and growing and I brought in the online courses and I actually got to a point in the business where I had to make a decision whether to bring on staff to help me deliver the design services or to say to stop delivering the design services altogether and double down on the courses. And I didn't really want to run another architectural practice and I realised that my time was much more scalable at a one-to-many level through those online courses. And I also felt that working with people, like people were overlooking the architect next door to work with me, never meeting them in person, never seeing their house or site in person. And then, and I was charging sort of $25,000 for these design concept packages. Um, and it just blew my mind that they were looking past people that were in the streets around them. So I just felt that I was much better placed to be teaching them how to find great people. I really believe that there's great people in the industry. It's just terrible at promoting yourself. And so, you know, to be able to find those great people, to be able to know the kinds of questions to ask them. And as much when they're having a, they're starting to on a terrible experience that they know enough that they can see the red flags and can then get themselves out of that before they've gone too far down it. And I find that people who dive into undercover architects content, it's this, they already know that they don't know everything. And as they start to research more, they realize they're just scratching the surface of all the things that they don't know. And a lot of them then know that if they get themselves educated and, in, and more, better informed, that they will have a far better um, experience of their project. And so for some people, then it's just a no brainer to purchase one of the online programs. Awesome, Th thank you both. <laughs> for the uh, comments and all the talks today. Mm, thank you. Pleasure, thank you. I think it's my turn. <laughs> Amelia, I just want to know more. Of, I know a little bit about Undercover Architect, but I don't know anything about your program with builders. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I started Live Life Build with Dwayne Pierce, who's a Brisbane-based builder, uh, a bit over maybe about 18 months ago. Um, he and I had collaborated on a few things through Undercover Architect. I'd actually found him on social media. He's uh, very, very passionate about improving the experience that everybody has when building and renovating. His very big, hairy, audacious goal is to go to a barbecue and to turn to somebody and say, I'm a builder and then just tell great good news stories about building and renovating. <laughs> and so, you know, so he, that was sort of, uh, you know, where he was always operating from. And we kept sort of collaborating on things and um, said, you know, we really should do something together about this, educating builders how to run their businesses better, and then also creating far better collaborative relationships between architects, designers and builders as well. And, you know, Dwayne has had a lot of great experience in working alongside architects and building designers in his work, really has a strong appreciation for design and the difference that it makes. 
and um, and we got approached by James Hardy and Brett's uh, Timber and Trade to present an educational workshop together to a group of builders. And we literally from that just decided to start a business and start running some coaching programs. And so we've got like a mastermind group where we have built a group of builders that we work with very closely to help them with, uh, Duane really helps them with some of the sort of nuts and bolts of running a, a building business that can be profitable and deliver quality homes. And uh, I very much help them with understanding how the client ticks and also about how to work with architects and designers. And we've created a process um, that we now teach to builders called the PAC process or the paid as consultant process. And this is where builders can come on board as a paid consultant during the design phase and basically support the designer and the client in advising on buildability and cost through the design phase. We've just both seen so many homeowners run that gauntlet of that design bid build model and end up at the bid point with a project that was two and three times the budget and and you know be just just completely demoralized by what they were going to do next i'd had the benefit at mervac of always having somebody from construction and costing sitting at the table during design discussions and saw the power of being able to kind of iterate the design with that information in train so yeah we're really we really want to be able to get those uh, two industries working together, that design and construction far more closely. And we've been doing some interesting research about the custom residential building industry generally, uh, which we're gonna continue doing so that we've got some benchmarking. We had a gut feel that the custom home builders are actually doing more work than the project home builders, but that the industry of, you know, the membership bodies and the brands are often geared towards the project home builders because it's easier to deal with one or two big companies rather than dealing with a whole plethora of individual custom home builders and the research that we've done actually shows that custom home builders and uh, builders doing renovations are outspending the volume builder industry annually by six billion dollars so what we want to do is galvanize those custom residential builders together so that they have a larger voice in the in the industry um, and be able to give homeowners a better option than having to buy a house off the shelf and just really shift and change the dynamic of the industry. A lot of those builders that are doing custom residential projects, they have a business revenue that's sort of capped at 1 million just because they, they're not taught how to run businesses. They don't know how to scale themselves, how to be more efficient with their time. So we see that we've got a lot of opportunity to help them understand how to improve their businesses so they can deliver at higher revenue, higher capacity levels. And we can just very, very uh, dramatically start changing the, the nature of the industry altogether. I think we could say the same about many architects too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Emma, do you have four? Um, does anyone else, if anyone else doesn't have questions, I have a question. I have like about eight questions, but I will just ask one. Um, it's for both of you. I don't mind if you both want to answer or one or the other, but it's more just about that conversation around um, on one hand, valuing our expertise and what we are really good at, and at the same time, not being so professionally territorial and allowing clients and people to be more empowered at the same time. And um, I find that to be quite a difficult thing to, to navigate at times. Um, do you have any pointers for how to, <laughs> how to do that? Uh, well, you know, therapy is always helpful um, to get past <laughs> the perfectionism and the controlling. For me, it's asking the right question. Like we have the expertise to ask the right question. Um, we know as a, a like, a, you know, I really resonate in terms of what Amelia was saying was navigating through all the different things that that within the built environment you've got to you've got to navigate through. And if you don't know, like, I mean, we all know the frustration of trying to fill out a form or even trying to book in for a COVID vaccine at the moment. Like it's really hard and it's really intimidating. And that's for people who are educated and can speak English as their first language. That's not all the, the rest, you know, the rest of our country. Um, and so I think we can use our expertise to ask the right question and to guide people um, and to challenge them as well. I think we're so sometimes stuck on the way that we do things that by challenging people to think differently or challenge people to, to see through the lens of someone else. I think that's the, that's the power we have in building communities and places that are really generous. And 
to Amelia's point, you know, the, the building houses that are, uh, make us feel sort of safe and, and, you know, warm and fuzzy because then that generosity then leaks out into our communities as well. So I think for us, it's my advice is just, just start asking the right questions. Just start asking questions. Be curious. I think they're the two things I would say. Mm. Thanks. Did you want to add anything, Amelia? Yeah, I would just say don't underestimate the relationship and connection that you can build with somebody before you even get to sit across the table from them um, through the way that you promote your business and you talk about your work in the public domain. Um, I found that when I made a commitment to Undercover Architect being about education first and started blogging, it just meant that people self-selected whether I was the architect for them and they had built a relationship with me and you know, understood sort of the way I thought about design before they showed up. And so they were trusting of me before we even, you know, sort of kicked off. And so I could, you know, I can take incredible, um, uh, I can really push my members and really push the people that I work with because there is such a deep trusting relationship that's based on me being generous with what mm -hmm. I, you know, with my information. So, and this is the, you know, like I have homeowners who've sat on, I know that they've watched somebody, you know, that they want to work with on social media for five years before they've made a decision to actually pick up the phone to speak to them. And so you can't waste that opportunity to really let somebody know who you are, what you stand for, you know, who you, what you don't stand for, what you believe and really build that relationship and connection with them before they're sitting down so that you then... I've never had to sort of, oh, no, never, I, I don't feel like I've had to convince people of things, you know, that because they already know that I think a certain way about stuff. They're trying to sometimes convince me otherwise of my opinions. And I'm just very straightforward about, you know, I don't mm. mince my words. I often inoculate people before I do speak to them. <laughs> my standard <laughs> catch cry before I have a Skype consult with my members can purchase Skype consults with me or design reviews with me. And so my standard catch cry at the beginning of that is, you know, I tend not to mince my words. What I may say may, you know, what I say may offend you. If it does, please understand that's not my intention. I'm just passionate about you getting the most from your investment in your home and the most from your investment in this service with me. So I'm just going to say it like it is. Mm. And their response is, yeah, that's what, that's why we're here. Mm. You know, so that's the thing is you've got to build that trust and you can do it before they even mm. get in touch with you. And mm -hmm. just, just jumping off that it's respect as well. Like, I think that mm. you can disagree with like, like this is the thing I think we've we've gone into this and I think this is my lesson from politics is we've gone into this thing where you're either with us or you're against us it's like <laughs> no actually there is this huge gray space that you work within and some of the best politicians Alex Greenwich is an, an amazing politician an amazing human an amazing politician because he understands the gray space and what can be achieved by building partnerships with people that you don't you don't, you wouldn't, you don't agree with on one issue, but you completely agree with it on another issue. And one of the things Clover used to always say is that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So you've got to have the good people around you to make good decisions that you can stand up in front of the community and stick behind. And you're going to get criticised, but as long as you know that it aligns to your values, then that's all you can do. At the end of the day, that's all you can do is, is, is have that, and there's been so many people when I say, oh, I work, for, I work for Clover, they go, everyone's got an opinion. And so they go, oh, you know, I don't like she did this. I don't like she did that or I never voted for her. But you know what? I respect her because I know where she stands. Mm. And mm. for me, that was such an important lesson. And, you know, when I worked for Clover, I, the deputy law mayor was Robin Kemmes, this amazing woman who was so supportive of urbanists as she had these great stories of she was involved in the women's movement in the 60s in Australia and, you know, great mates with Anne Summers and some of those sort of, you know, Eva Cox, those legends of kind of feminism in Australia. And, and, uh, and again, it's, it's, that's where I learnt this amazing ability, like that empathy and, you know, what Amelia talks about, that, that empathy that you have for people of understanding, sitting in their shoes, understanding, trying to learn about them and build that trust you can get so much out of that. Mm. And it's the richness in those conversations that I think makes our jobs and the result better. That's awesome. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> I just have one, I think, more question, which is um, Anna. Did you want to come off mute, Anna, and introduce yourself? 
and ask your question? I, oh, which one? I've asked so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just uh, wondering um, how you've, if you've found that the, the lockdowns on and off has it impacted your, your business a lot in terms of, I mean, we can do a lot by Zoom, including, you know, completion inspections. And I, I often adopt this thing with potential clients saying, you know, you can be the cinematographer and I'll be the film director as a way of kind of looking through a, a potential reno or something. But um, it's, it's had a lot of, of, I've experienced a lot of sort of stop start and, you know, every lockdown people get very distracted and the, the reno that they, they were really keen to get going on as soon as possible just sort of goes to the back burner again. Um, that, have other people find, found it difficult to manage that? in terms of workflow, et cetera? I think that one's yours. You can talk, Amelia. I, I, okay. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think um, it's more of Amelia one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I think that it's been really interesting. I think this, these latest round of lockdowns have been very different to the ones we were experiencing last year. I think that there was a lot of um, energy and, of course, you know, with the Home Builder Scheme coming in, there was a lot of um, activity that came out of the last range of lockdowns. These ones, particularly Sydney's lockdown, that's just sort of seems to keep getting tacked on and tacked on, seems to have hurt people a lot more um, significantly. And people I have seen generally have gone quiet. That being said, there was already, I see with our builder members, they already had a lot of projects sort of in flow that were going through. They equally, uh, you know, that whole thing of having to do things remotely is always super challenging. I find that the best experience that I've had with that personally is when the homeowner actually really understands what they've got to look for and the kinds of things that they're paying attention to so that they can kind of meet you really well in terms of, you know, illustrating their property to them or to you, all those questions that they have or doing those walkthroughs and those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, I know that there's people out there that I was chatting to a builder today and he said, look, we've never been busier, but no one really is making any more money. So it's this thing of nobody really knows whether in all the price increases that have been coming through, nobody really knows where the money is actually sort of landing. And he was talking about a tile supplier who said that the shipping container cost has gone from being, uh, was generally around 500, 500, 500 to $550 to land a shipping container of tiles here, you know, sort of 18 months ago, it's now three and a half thousand dollars. So it's that, that kind of stuff. It's not, it's not going into the pockets of the people that are immediate to us. It's so far down the line. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of homeowners generally are trying to figure out, do they put their projects on hold? My, my, uh, my suggestions always to them are, look, I just feel like the construction industry is such a large part of our GDP. The government always does something to kind of boost it. The HIA and the MBA are both political donors, donors to both sides of politics. So they always compel the government to do something to take care of the construction industry. Um, the home builder was a really missed opportunity. Um, it did though generate a lot of work for certain sectors of the industry. Um, equally, you've had, you know, companies, big volume builders actually paying people, you know, $2,000 to cancel their contracts because they can't deliver them at the fixed prices that they agreed to them on. So some parts of the sector are saying that we're going to be finding this interesting thing happening in the next 12 to 18 months um, where things might, you know, start to level out. Others are saying it's just going to keep inclining. So, and homeowners are just really confused, you know, some of them who had prices, pro, you know, projects priced sort of eight months ago, they're seeing those projects move 10%, 15% in price. And so they're then grappling with, do I redesign? Do I just stump up? You know, I've got more equity in my property now because the real estate prices are going with it. Do I have the capacity to borrow more? Um, there's just a lot of confusion out there. So I think it's that thing of, as an architect, you can't really give like an equivocal answer to when well, none of us have a crystal ball. So it's just helping people sort of navigate that uncertainty. And my experience looking back over 25 years is construction prices have always done this. You know? So they've never, they've never gone back down. People keep waiting for the correction. I don't know, even when we had the GFSA, you know, and the schools program, we still saw residential construction costs increase. So it's a really, really tricky one. Well, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Anna. So <laughs> I spent lockdown renovating, so this is feeling very. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I'm I'm trying to build a flat pack kitchen right now, so <laughs> you know if anyone knows a good bench person, awesome. 
Shoot, shoot their details to me, thanks, LinkedIn. <laughs> Thank you for answering those questions so generously. Um, I think we're going to head to breakout rooms for a bit. If people want to hang around, if you don't, is now the time to leave, Justine? Yes, I think if you're not if you're not up for that, now's the time. Um, they are fun. Um, we've had a really long conversation, so we'll just be in the breakout rooms for maybe fifteen to twenty minutes. It's just a really great opportunity to you know meet people who you might other, not otherwise meet or sometimes people find themselves in rooms with old friends who they you know were not expecting so that's kind of fun as well um it's pretty random and i'm just going to push a sign and um you'll end up where you end up if a whole lot of people disappear um <laughs> i will uh then combine you know rooms so that you know there's enough people in them sitting on their own <laughs> <laughs> I just, but I also just want to say thank you very much to everybody involved. And we're nice to do a little clap. Um, thank you particularly to April and Amelia, but also really to Ali and Emma for um, getting this all off yeah. the ground. Um, it's really thank you. fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, we've got stacks of events coming up at Parlour and we're kicking off the light at the end of the tunnel sessions again this Friday with... Um, Naomi and I talking to um, Sarah Bennett from Six Degrees and, um, oh gosh, T.Y. Gill from Grimshaw um, called Lessons from the Lockdown. I know April doesn't want to hear anything about lockdown, so she won't be there, but some of us hopefully might have an interesting conversation. So, um, And we've got lots more things coming up too, so um, I hope that we'll see you there. But I also just want to thank AWS, who is our partner who supports the whole Salon program. Um, uh, obviously started off with lots and lots of in-person events, but um, continuing to support the whole program, including these online events. I just want to thank them too.